Hello, I'm Stephen Fagan, curator of the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza. Our institution's ongoing oral history project explores the history and culture of the 1960s, as well as the life, death, and legacy of President John F. Kennedy. This year, to celebrate Martin Luther King Day and Black History Month, we are pleased to present Voices from the Civil Rights Movement, a special series of recent oral history interviews with 1960s activists. In these intimate, detailed, one-on-one -on -one conversations, an outstanding group of storytellers share powerful memories from several key moments of the movement, including the Montgomery bus boycott, Freedom Rides, the March on Washington, Mississippi Freedom Summer, the Selma to Montgomery March, and the SCOPE project of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. We hope that these remarkable, relevant stories will spark conversation and build bridges of understanding and communication between generations. Please keep in mind that these are full, free-flowing oral history interviews. In addition to moments of technical difficulties, there may be harsh language and graphic descriptions of violence. Viewer discretion is advised. If you or someone you know would like to share memories of the 1960s or articulate how President Kennedy has impacted your life, please contact us at oralhistory at jfk.org. We continue to record conversations year-round as part of this ongoing archival initiative, and we believe that everyone has a story. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope that you enjoy these voices from the Civil Rights Movement. And ma'am, at the start, we always invite our guests to introduce themselves uh, with their full name, date and place of birth, and just a, a little background to get started. Sure. Uh, I'm Mimi Real. My formal name is Miriam, but I've always been known as, as Mimi. I was born in Brooklyn, New York on May 31st, 1941. And I, was, I grew up in New York. Uh, very blessed to have parents who were uh, very, very uh, conscious of, of social justice. They were very progressive in their politics, which was very, very unusual for the um, 1940s and 1950s. And indeed, they got into trouble. Uh, they were victims of the McCarthy era and both lost their jobs working for the New York City uh, school system. <clears throat> uh, my father was, had been a high school math teacher. My mother was a high school librarian. And um, I went to public schools in, <clears throat> in New York. Um, I might add that my father reinvented himself after he lost his job and started a school for, for um, mentally retarded children, who, children who could, could not go to the public schools um, at, at all. And in, in that era, there were really two choices. Either you, uh, you went to the public schools or you were institutionalized. And so he was providing a third alternative, which was, um, education and in life skills and, and very um, elementary academic skills. Anyway, um, and my mother reinvented herself as a librarian. And this always struck me as one of the greatest ironies because she was fired by the New York City Board of Education. Um, and of course they're all fired for insubordination. They're fired for refusing to answer questions, not because they were, were or were not members of <clears throat> some suspicious organization. And to make a long story short, um, she learned some years later that there were openings at, in the uh, Brooklyn Public Library. And either the various agencies of the New York City government don't talk to each other, or the Brooklyn Public Library simply didn't care. But uh, here was my mother who had a master's in library science, years and years and years of professional experience as a librarian. And of course they absolutely lapped her right up. And, um, but anyway, um, when it came time for me to go to college, I wanted to go to a college that was socially conscious, which in those days, again, was something a little bit anomalous. And so I chose Swarthmore, which was a Quaker no, it still is a 
a, a Quaker school and founded on on a lot of Quaker principles, and it, it still prided itself on um, on those principles, um, on on its openness to activity in primarily the peace movement. The um, at that time, that was about the only movement that was that was uh, going on. And it was while I was at Swarthmore, I became involved in a student group called the Swarthmore Political Action Committee, SPAC. And uh, we did whatever uh, social action there was to do at the time, which at, the, at first was very, very little. It was mostly going into Philadelphia to take part in, in rallies uh, organized by the Committee for a Sane Nuclear Policy, which um, was called SANE for short. And then the sit-ins came along. And although we were in the North, so we weren't directly involved with the sit-ins, um, in conjunction with the sit-ins, the NAACP organized a nationwide boycott of Woolworths and Kresge's. And there was a Woolworths in the town right near Swarthmore, uh, Chester. And so we would, every weekend, we would go into Chester and picket Woolworths as, as part of that. <clears throat> as part of that movement. And then um, I became aware, thanks to an aunt of my, my mother's sister who worked for uh, a number of social justice organizations. And she became, she knew of an organization called CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. And she suggested that I do volunteer work there during my breaks from college. So that's what I did. And so I was on the ground floor, so to speak, when the Freedom Rides were being organized. I mean, I was working in the office when people were talking about the original Freedom Rides, because that's who originated the Freedom Rides was CORE. Mm -hmm. And um, when, uh, when, well, the, the Freedom Rides were scheduled to start, I think, at the end of May. And at that time, I think things have changed since then. But at that time, the the academic year at, col at most colleges didn't end until sometime in early June. And um, I was a responsible enough student that, that uh, I wasn't going to leave before the end of my sophomore year. So I finished out my sophomore year and and I had already applied to CORE to, to be on the Freedom Rides. And I was sent on the, the it was the first ride available after school was, was over, uh, which was in June. And uh, it, it just so happened to be the, the first bus that was going to go through the state of Alabama after the famous bus burning. Because after the bus burning, the governor of Alabama had issued um, an injunction against CORE, forbidding CORE to uh, send its freedom riders through the great state of Alabama. So they continued the freedom rides, but they just took great detours through other states to end up in, um, in Mississippi. But we, as luck would have it, my group was going to be the first group. The, the um, restraining order expired after several weeks. And so we were going to be on the, the first bus. And so there was, needless to say, a fair amount of, of nervousness about what was going to happen. I mean, you know, there, there was one of two alternatives. I mean, either our bus was going to meet the same fate or Alabama would have learned its lesson because by now, of course, the federal government had its eyes on Alabama and, and um, the, the, the nationwide, <clears throat> the eyes of the nation were on Alabama. And so they may have figured we'd better try to play it straight and, and let these crazy people come through our state with <clears throat> without any problems. And that is, that is more or less what happened. I mean, we we um, we did have all kinds of problems. We didn't we didn't have any overt violence against us. Um, we uh, our group met up in 
in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and it was a very, very mixed group, the men and women, whites and blacks. Um, most of us were young college students. There was um, one couple, uh, a minister from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, uh, Wyatt T. Walker and his wife uh, were part of our group. And we left Atlanta and rode on a trailways bus to, to Montgomery. And we spent the night actually in Montgomery. And I do have to say, probably the one of the scarier moments of the ride was when the bus, the bus pulled into or was pulling up to the trailways depot in, in Montgomery. And we could see this, there was this very, very angry mob across the street that was being held back by a very, very meager line of those, those, those wooden barrier things that police used to use. And a very thin row of, of sheriff's deputies or state troopers or whatever they were, all decked out in cowboy hats and beer bellies and um, the, the people in this mob were not very friendly looking. I mean, they, they uh, it was virtually all men and they might as well have been right out as Hollywood Central Casting. I swear they all had beer bellies and I don't remember if they were waving actual rifles. They might've been, but they were certainly waving their arms and they were screaming something. We had the windows and the bus closed for a variety of reasons, not the least of which was that this was June and it was hot outside and the, air, the bus was air conditioned. Um, so we didn't hear what they were screaming, but it certainly wasn't welcome to Montgomery. The, the bus driver was scared to death and he actually would not let us off the bus um, at the trailways terminal. He drove us down the street to a black owned dry cleaners and so everybody else, all the other passengers got off the bus at the terminal and we got off the bus down the street. And apparently at that point, our group was approached by a reporter from one of the Montgomery newspapers or the Montgomery newspaper. And he apparently singled me out as the most normal person in the group which I've never known how to take, whether that was, you know, I should feel pleased that he thought I looked normal or that anyway. But in any event, he, the only reason I mention this is that he ended up writing me a letter, which eventually got delivered to me when I was in Parchman prison. It was like a four page letter. And it was, I, when I read it even to this day, I am overwhelmed by um, its tone. I mean, the, it, it, is, it is basically a diatribe against the Freedom Riders. We, we were a bunch of crazy, commie, hippie, um, you know, end loving. Uh, I mean, every, every adjective that he could, a derogatory adjective that he could think of to throw at us. Um, and that he wanted to assure me that we had it all wrong and that the Negroes in, in, in Montgomery were very happy with their situation, you know, on and on and on like that. And uh, um, that, that, that Alabama was perfectly within its rights to defend itself against this invasion of, of commie hippie weirdos um, in wearing, wearing Birkenstock sandals um, and, uh, and he ended the letter by urging me to come back to Montgomery and he would be happy to show me the real Montgomery. Needless to say, I never answered him nor did I ever take him up on his kind invitation. But anyway, we spent the night in Montgomery. Um, we were picked up at the, at, the, at the bus terminal by a number of black families who, who were all going to host us for, for the night. And the, one of the things that struck me immediately was the, the realities of, of, of 
what segregation meant in the South. So there was there were two other white women in the group. Uh, one of them I had come all the way down from New York with, she was from Boston. And she and I were gonna spend the night at the same person's house. So we were, we were put in the back seat of their car and we were told to lie on the floor of the car so that we could not be seen. Because at that point in Alabama, it was illegal for whites and blacks to ride together in a car um, unless the driver was the chauffeur and the people in the back were, the white people you know, were, were in the back and were the, the masters or whatever, the passengers. Um, so that's what we did. And then when we got to their home, we were, uh, it was a lovely home, um, nice middle-class typical home with a huge picture window in the living room that looked out on the sidewalk. And we were told to stay away from the window because once again, it was illegal for whites to be in a house, in a, a black owned home, uh, unless, Again, the only way you could have blacks and whites in the same house was if the, the blacks were the, the household staff, the, the maids or whatever, the gardeners. Um, so we, we spent the night there. Um, and uh, as I say, my, my mind kept getting boggled through this whole, this whole experience. I knew all about how evil segregation was on a theoretical level but I had never ever encountered it. I mean, I went to school with kids of all colors and nationalities and races and what, I mean, it, it was never an issue in Brooklyn, but here, you know, every way you turned in, in the most innocent of circumstances, um, you like this, the family we were staying with didn't know how to treat us. I mean, they insisted that we eat dinner and then the next morning breakfast in their formal dining room while they ate in the kitchen. And Judy and I, the other girl and I, um, you know, we tried to eat with them in the kitchen. We said, no, no, we want to eat with you. We don't. And it, it was out of the question. No, 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 we were their guests. We had to eat in. So we ate at the formal dining room table and they served us. And um, it was at breakfast the next morning that I first learned about grits. Um, so again, growing up in Brooklyn, you know, you're from Texas, I, I assume, so you know all about grits, but I had never met a grit in my life, but I had been raised on hot cereal. So the next morning for breakfast, um, the, woman of the house comes in with um, with a huge platter of scrambled eggs. I mean, enough, it could have fed our entire group and a huge platter of sausages and a big serving dish with this white stuff in it. And uh, the place setting, all we had was what looked like a dinner plate, you know, a, a flat plate and there were no bowls. And then of course there were coffee cups and there was a coffee pot. And neither Judy nor I knew what this white stuff was in the serving bowl, but we assumed that it was hot cereal, that it looked just like cream of rice or cream of wheat. And that's, and we thought, well, maybe this is a Southern custom. They don't eat it in bowls, they eat it on their plate. So we treated it like you would treat mashed potatoes at Thanksgiving. So we made a little mound of it on the plate and then made a little well in the mound and poured cream from the coffee creamer and sprinkled it with sugar and proceeded to eat it. And we thought it was delicious. And the poor, the poor woman of the household came out at one point to find out if we were doing okay, if there was anything more we needed. And I have to give her such enormous credit for not bursting out laughing I mean, she obviously did not want to embarrass us, um, but it was cl obviously clear that we had no clue what to do with grits. You know, we, and we proceeded to, you know, so the grits were in one corner of the plate and then 
elsewhere on the plate was a little pile of scrambled eggs and then, and then the sausage next to it. <laughs> it never occurred to us. Um, I don't remember now when I actually learned about grits, but I, I, I really learned ab about grits when later on, a couple of years later, I was working in Louisiana on a voter registration project. And, and then of course, um, I would, you know, uh, we'd be living with, with a, a local black person and they would, they would bring us out a, a, a plate for breakfast and, you know, would have the tip, the, the plate would be covered with grits. And then on top of that would be piled all the, as I say, at that point in Montgomery, we had no clue, but anyway, we, um, so, and at the Montgomery terminal, we had a couple of incidents. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, when we went to the, to the bus station to get on our bus, um, first of all, we attempted to integrate the, the, the white only lunch counter. There was a, you know, whatever it is, but whatever it's called in a bus station. And so, so, our whole little group went trooping into the, to, to the, this coffee bar lunch counter thing. And we all sat down on stools at, at the, at the counter and we all ordered coffee or whatever. And a, a, you could see the guy behind the counter was terrified. He knew exactly what was happening. He knew exactly who, what we were. And um, he, he, it was like, he was between a rock and a hard place, but, so he followed the rules. So and and at that point, Alabama was was enforcing the rule that segregation was not allowed for interstate travel. And so he insisted on seeing our bus tickets before he would serve us. And we, of course, we all had bus tickets for Jackson, Mississippi. And so we were going interstate. And so that was okay. He could serve us coffee reluctantly, but he could serve us coffee. Meanwhile, there's this whole adventure going on with the bus. So uh, I don't remember in what order these occurred, but the first thing that happens is that there is this series of loud explosions and everybody, including us, assumes that the bus is being shot at or, some, or something, that we're gonna have another bus incident here. And so, so, Again, Alabama's not taking any chances. Um, law enforcement was called out. They did an absolutely thorough, thorough search of the bus and finally determined that it was firecrackers that had been set off by people who were trying to scare us. Okay, at about the same time, the driver for that route, with, you know, Montgomery to Jackson, shows up for his run, takes one look at the situation that he's gonna be confronted with and leaves. He flees basically, refuses. I mean, he absolutely refuses to drive the bus. So there's now this delay while Trailways tries to find another bus driver that is willing to, to um, take us on, on his bus. And they do finally come up with somebody who made it very, very clear before we got on the bus that that there were he would drive the bus under certain conditions. Um, number one, uh, we would all have to sit in the back, whites and blacks. And so, I mean, that was no skin off our backs. I mean, that was fine with us. And the other was that we were not to leave the bus uh, under any circumstances until we got to Jackson. And this was the milk run. I mean, this bus stopped at every crossroads. And as you know, there are many of them in the rural South. Every, practically every crossroads that, that had a little convenience store and gas station, it would stop. We could not get off the bus, nor of course, could any of the black people on the bus get off the bus. Um, so there we were stuck on this bus and the, the bus, 
it, as I say, it, it was like the milk run. So this is almost like, like um, you know, public transportation in a city. At, it, it starts in Montgomery, and as we move along, more and more people get on the bus, and, and until uh, fairly soon, it was standing room only. And so there we are, our little group sitting in the back of the bus, and the we're surrounded by black people because they're, of course, they're forced to stand in the back of the bus. And they, of course, immediately realize who we are. And to this day, I am so overcome by their reaction because every single person thanked us so with such feeling and such depth and such emotion thanked us for risking our lives for them. I mean, it was almost like they were saying, who are we? We're nobodies. And you people have come from wherever you came from, your comfortable homes, and you're literally risking your lives for us. And they just couldn't get over it. And one young man in particular, he was a serviceman and he had family in Mississippi and he he was stationed somewhere in Hawaii and he was on his way back to his station and he had been home visiting his family and his mother had loaded him up with food had given him literally this huge picnic basket filled with food and a box with a homemade cake in it and he insisted on giving us all the food in that basket and the cake. And we kept saying, well, because, and again, this came as such a huge shock to me that this is what life was like for blacks. You wanted to, to travel from point A to point B, you knew you weren't gonna be able to get off the bus and use any of these 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 rest stops or these little convenience places you, to even go, you, you couldn't even go into the convenience store. Some of them, you might've been able to go around to the back and there'd be a little window and maybe you could ask for a candy bar or something. But um, um, so this young man's mother had loaded him up with enough food to last him until he got to Jackson and then got on his plane to go back to Hawaii. And he insisted, and we kept saying to him, no, 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 this is your food, you need it. And he kept saying, I mean, no, you, you guys, you're, you know, you're making this enormous sacrifice, you take it. So we, we feasted on this wonderful lunch of fried chicken and cornbread. And um, I don't remember what else was in the, the picnic basket. Uh, we may have insisted that he keep some of the food for himself just so he had something to eat, but he insisted that we take the cake. And um, I, w one of my stronger memories of, of that whole part of the trip was that I became the, uh, the keeper of the cake. And so I held on, it was in a pink bakery box, you know, with string, but it, the, the mom had home made the cake. I held onto that box, like, you know, life, life itself um, through all the, the permutations and combinations that we went through. Um, well, eventually we got, we made it to Jackson and Jackson was an anticlimax. Um, and I'm sure that other people have, have told the story. Um, the justice department had made this kind of uh, devil's, devil's agreement with, with Mississippi that the justice department would, would turn its face and um, ignore, um, ignore the segregation that was going on within the bus terminal if Mississippi would promise that there would be no violence and that the Freedom Riders would be arrested and jailed unhurt. And, um, and that is exactly what happened. So it was, it was a choreographed dance, literally. We got off the bus in Jackson and it's, in Jackson, it's a big terminal, so it's off the street. And we get off the bus and we file into the white only waiting room, which has, you know, it's, it has two entrances, one from the terminal and then one onto the, the street. We file in from the terminal and waiting for us in the terminal was a, 
uh, was a uh, deputy um, sheriff whose name I for Sergeant Ray, I think that was his name. And he was waiting for us. I mean, Core and other Core had let Jackson know exactly when busloads of Freedom Riders would be arriving. So he was there, and we went through, as I say, this little choreographed routine where um, he ordered us to leave the, the waiting room um, and said that if we did not leave, he would put us under arrest. We, of course, did not leave. He did this three times. We, of course, did not leave. He put us under arrest and let us out the front door where there was already waiting a black Mariah, a black paddy wagon, which we were all loaded into, you know, it was all very peaceful. And we uh, were taken to the, the Jackson City Jail, me still clutching my pink cake box. We were booked in the, in the Jackson City Jail and they held up to their promise that there was going to be no physical violence. And I stress the word physical because they did everything they could short of that to harass us. So first, then of course, I'm again blown away. So we, we go to the, the, the um, Jackson City Jail is in the Jackson City Hall building or whatever it's called on an upper floor. So they have to get us up there on elevators. And, and it took multiple elevator rides because of course we couldn't mix, God forbid, blacks and whites in the same elevator car. Um, so anyway, they finally got us up there and they take us into booking and we're booked individually. And CORE again had done excellent, excellent preparation with us. They, they had walked us through everything that we could expect and what we were required to do and what we were not required to do. And they said, when you go in to be interrogated by the, the sheriff's deputies, you are required to give your name, you know, name, rank and serial number. Um, but beyond that, you are not required to answer any questions. And they're gonna ask you what your religion is. You don't have to answer, you, um, they, you can, uh, et cetera. So anyway, so there I am in, in the uh, interrogation room with this guy who again is right out of Hollywood Central Casting. Um, I've never seen so many beer bellies in my life. And he starts, you know, every other question out of his mouth is like, oh, so you must date the N-word. Or are you a member of the Communist Party? Are you a member of the NAACP? Are you, um, a bazillion questions like that. Um, as I say, it was verbal abuse um, and I was prepared for it and I was not gonna fall for it. I, 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 it was all a trap. Um, and I, so I, um, I didn't answer all those questions. I mean, I gave him my name and all that stuff at the beginning. And then he asked me my religion and that was when I had uh, one of these, you know, your, your life passes before your eyes in a split second. I had this, this major um, philosophical debate in my head. And so I'm Jewish, but I thought to myself, and, but of course I was aware that the South in addition to being very racist was also in, in the early 1960s, not particularly known for its love of Jews, let's put it that way. So I thought, okay, if I say Jewish, what further thing am I opening myself up to? I mean, are they going to then walk me out a back door and take me off somewhere and do heavens knows what? Okay, so should I, should I lie and either say I don't have a religion? I thought that wouldn't go down very well either in the God-fearing South. Or I could lie and choose some Christian denomination. 
but that would uh, there was a very very fundamental like gut level of me that I couldn't lie I I I could not deny my identity. So I figured, okay, I'll just take whatever risk comes. And I said, okay, I you know, said, I'm Jewish. And the deputy sneered at me and said, oh, so you're a Jewess. Um, I don't know that I had ever heard that word used conversationally. I had certainly read it in like Shakespeare or you know, um, stuff from several centuries ago, but I never heard anybody use the word. <clears throat> and quite honestly, <clears throat> I had no idea what he was even quite driving at. So I must have looked at him kind of quizzically, and he said, "You know, the people who who um, how do you phrase it the." the people who think they're better than everybody or the people who think, you know, who, 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 the people who say, who say they are uh, better. And I realized that what he was riffing on was the concept of chosen people. And of course he had it completely wrong. That isn't what the phrase means at all. And so I thought, oh my God, what have I gotten into here? I am not starting some kind of ecumenical discussion with a deputy sheriff in Mississippi about what the meaning of chosen people is. Um, so I, I mean, at that, I was seriously, I was struck dumb. I didn't know what to say, so I didn't say anything. And, and then he continued on with his, with his questions along the lines of who I dated and who I slept with and um, uh, stuff like that. And then we were led off to uh, be fingerprinted and photographed. That's, that's when uh, the famous mugshot of all of us Freedom Riders were taken with the little plaque um, on a chain around our neck with a, with a number on it. And um, the, they just really loved those questions because the photographer proceeded to ask the, the same series of questions. Um, and uh, which of course I, I also didn't answer. Um, but I do have to say, if you look at my mugshot, um, I'm smiling. <clears throat> and I did that deliberately. Because I, I, I mean, first of all, I did not feel like I was a prisoner having a mugshot taken. I mean, I, I, I was a soldier in an army that was fighting against some terrible injustice and I was proud of who I was and, and the, the situation that I was in right there. And there was no reason not to smile. In addition to which, when somebody shoves a camera in your face, you know, they, they, they position you in front of a camera and say, okay, now I'm gonna take your picture, automatically you smile. I mean, the only other circumstance like that was at the, D, like the, the DMV, you know, the. Department of Motor Vehicles, where you're getting your driver's license picture taken. So I smiled, but I always, I, but I always interpreted that as me thumbing my nose at them, you know, my deliberate way of, of getting back at them. And anyway, um, we were then taken over to the county jail, me with the pink cake box still clutched in my arms. And there, it, the, all the previous riders were at the county jail. And the, 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 in the county jail, they had one cell per gender slash race. So there was one white women's cell. And by the time I got there, there were probably at least a dozen or 15 women in a cell meant for eight. There were four sets of bunk beds um, hanging by chains from the walls. So we, we all got mattresses and we would spread the mattresses out on the floor to, to sleep at night. And, um, and that was where finally we shared the cake. So everybody in the cell um, got, to, got to share in this young man's mother's wonderful um, layer cake. Um, 
we hadn't been there more than a day or two when Mississippi instituted its plan to transfer the Freedom Riders to the state penitentiary, which was a very, very carefully crafted plan. It was win-win as far as Mississippi was concerned. Because first of all, by, <clears throat> by this time, the county jail was totally, totally overcrowded. You know, it was bursting at the seams with Freedom Riders. And second of all, Mississippi wanted more than anything else to get rid of the Freedom Riders, to stop them from coming. And so they thought, aha, we'll transfer them all to our notorious state penitentiary and the Freedom Riders will be so terrified that they'll turn tail and run back where they came from. You know, whatever hippie commie rock they crawled out from under, um, which of course was not the case at all. I mean, that's not how we reacted, but we, we all knew within a day or two that we were going to be transferred to Parchman and that it would be done in stages. They weren't gonna take all, by that time, 20 or 25 of us up at one time. They didn't have, uh, I, th I think they just took us up in, pa in a paddy wagon, so, or a small bus in any event. So um, I was in the second group of women to be, to be taken up there. And uh, in a way, I'm always very, very grateful for that because in, it was after, it was in subsequent groups that were brought in where they really started to physically harass women as they came. They get, have you heard about the vaginal exams? No, no, no one has spoken about that. I don't know if this is proper to speak about, and you can always eliminate this from the tape, but um, on the theory that freedom riders were trying to smuggle all kinds of illegal substances into the jail, they did vaginal searches on all the incoming women Freedom Rider prisoners. And the vaginal searches were conducted by a woman trustee, a prisoner. Um, and she had, now, as I say, I never witnessed this uh, myself because mercifully I came in before they started this, but what, what, from what the other girls said, she had, on the one hand, she was gloved, but on the other hand, she never changed her glove. She had one glove and there was a, a bucket of some sort of disinfectant. She would, she would dip her hand in the bucket and then proceed to conduct the exam on the next girl. And we heard these exams. I mean, the girls would be screaming in pain um, and we could hear them screaming. Um, but anyway, mercifully, I was spared that. And uh, so we were put, and they housed us, this was another, uh, uh, another tactic of, of, of uh, Mississippi. They housed us in the maximum security unit. So Parchman is primarily a prison farm and it's acres and acres and acres of, of farmland with cottages on it. And most prisoners live in the cottages, but the most recalcitrant prisoners and also the death row prisoners are in the maximum security unit where they're, they're locked up in cells all day. And apparently there weren't all that many prisoners in maximum security at that point. So there was a whole row of cells um, that, that they could take over for the women freedom riders. So we were segregated by cell, but the cells were scattered so there'd be a you know black cell and a white cell and then two black cells and then a white cell and <clears throat> a black cell. And it was pretty much the same. The men were on the other side of the building, the other wing of the building. Um, and they similarly were, were segregated. They were more crowded over there than we were. Although even by the time um, my group got there, we filled all the cells and they were putting us three to a cell in cells that were meant for two. There were two bunk beds hanging from the wall. So one of us, uh, and we took turns, slept on the floor on a thin mattress. Um, and there were a series of things they did to try to make us as miserable as possible. Oh, the, so the, the other reason for the, for the maximum security unit. One was that, that this was a way of making us miserable 
And again, word would get out and the Freedom Riders would say, oh my gosh, I'm gonna end up with Parchman, no way, and flee for home. Um, but the other, the other reason, now they, they claimed that they were doing this for our protection because if they allowed us to live in the cottages, um, heavens knows what would happen to us women, particularly the white women. And we would no doubt be raped by the black prisoners. Now exactly how that was supposed to happen, I have no idea, but that was their rationale. They were protecting us. We of course interpreted it exactly the opposite that they were protect, protecting their prisoners from our ideas. <clears throat> Heaven forbid their prisoners should be infected by these, these new ideas of social justice and, and, and try to do something. So they kept us very, very separate. And they tried to make us miserable. They, they um, threatened at one point that if we didn't stop singing, they would take our mattresses. We didn't stop singing, so they took our mattresses. And so for a couple of days, we didn't even have mattresses to sleep on. We, one girl, one of us would be sleeping on the concrete floor. The other two would be sleeping on um, the bunk beds were a sheet of steel with little ventilation holes cut in it. So you'd wake up in the morning with these little, you know, circular marks all over your body from, um, and, and then they would, they turned the um, air cooling system as high as they could. So it would get pretty chilly at night. And all we had was a thin sheet to cover ourselves with, and then we'd be sleeping on this cold steel. So that went on for a couple of days. And the only reason we got our mattresses back was that word had reached the governor of um, Montana. No, Montana? No. Minnesota. Minnesota, Minnesota. thank you. Um, I knew it was one of those M states, um, Minnesota, that that a number of residents of his fair state had uh, were being incarcerated in in Jackson, Mississippi, and or in, in Parchman, and were being mistreated, and they were going to send down a commission to investigate. And of course, Mississippi. I mean, on one level, it was totally, totally political and played out just as you would expect it to play out. And on the other hand, it did what it was supposed to do. I mean, it it put a little bit of the fear of God in in the state of Mississippi. So when they heard that this delegation was coming, um, they very quickly returned our mattresses, gave us fresh clothing, um, gave us, I think, fresh sheets and, um, uh, you know, made us look all nice and spiffy. By the way, our clothing, the women's clothing, I, I didn't find out until 10 years ago at the 50th anniversary of the Freedom Rides that the men were not in black and white striped pants because we women wore black and white striped skirts. They would give us a, um, we would be brought out to shower once a week. And when you went up to the shower, your, your whole cell, you know, the two or three of you in a cell would be marched up to the shower, which is at one end of the cell block. And you take your shower and you'd be given a fresh skirt. And you still continued to wear the blouse that you were wearing when you entered. Um, and, uh, and anyway, the, the, the skirts were a source of, you know, much, much amusement among all of us. And as I say, I had always assumed that the men wore black and white striped pants, but it turned out they didn't. They wore shorts of some kind. It sounded a lot more comfortable than the skirts. But anyway, um, so they had given us fresh skirts. And, and so when, when this delegation came through, and of course the delegation is accompanied by prison officials. And, and so the whole thing is really, it, it, it's a put up job. I mean, you know, nobody was telling the truth in, including, I mean, the Freedom Riders couldn't really get the commission aside and say, okay, this is what's really happening. But whatever, it, it, it um, uh, I don't think the jailers attempted to stop us from singing after that. I mean, cause we went right on singing um, and right on doing all the other things that we did. 
Were you aware about the uh, when when the men's wing was sprayed with insecticide? No, no, okay. I didn't know that story until quite a number of years. Well, after the, um, I I think it was either when the book came out, Eric Etheridge's book came out, or um, that NPR um, series Eyes on the Prize came out. And I think that the, that story, the, the, the story of them being sprayed and being sprayed with, with high powered hoses. Um, we could sometimes hear them screaming, the men, but we didn't know what was going on and nobody would tell us. Um, and so we all spent um, about a month in Parchman and then we were released. And then over the course of the next months see we we hadn't yet stood trial we were um so that fall we were all brought back to mississippi to stand trial and that was another quite frankly that was a horror story i mean you know i look back on it now at the time i i don't even know that i'd say it was funny but it was the horror of it as I've gotten older and as I've, I have taught American history and American government and saw how that particular courtroom of a jury trial was conducted was unbelievably horrifying. It was like something out of the third world. I mean, f first of all, first of all, the jury is all white men. At that point, in early, the early 1960s. I don't know if women were forbidden to serve on juries. I think that that was the situation, but in, but in any, there was no attempt to put women. And of course there were no blacks on the jury and the average age of the jurors must've been like 75. I shouldn't speak so disparagingly of 75 now given my age, but at the time, I mean, it was a bunch of old men half of whom at least appeared to fall asleep during most of the proceedings, as did the judge, who did not seem to pay attention at all to the proceedings. Um, th there was, I mean, there was an attempt to make it a legal proceeding. We had, a, we had attorneys, um, there was a black law firm in, in, New, in um, Jackson that represented us and uh, and they did a very, very good job, but I mean, they had nothing to go on. I mean, um, and um, as I say, the, 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 the judge looked like he practically fell asleep. And, and then when he went to, to deliver his verdict, he turned his back on the courtroom and sort of delivered the verdict to the wall, um, which of course was guilty. And then I was let out of the courtroom and then the next kid was, was let, I mean, it was just, it was, as I say, <laughs> unbelievable. Um, so, uh, and I might say, by the way, that those convictions were appealed and went all the way to the Supreme Court, which overturned them. So um, that, that always interested me. I, I didn't know that also until years later. Um, okay, so that was the Freedom Rides. Um, Meanwhile, I'm still in college. So I go back to school that fall and um, by that time, I'm trying to remember what, by that time there were some local issues that dealt with race that we could deal with uh, for example, there was a roller skating rink um, that in, in that general area of suburban Philadelphia that was for all intents and purposes segregated. It, of course, it couldn't have signage. This is Pennsylvania after all, but they had various euphemistic names for the various kinds of nights. And so on some nights, whites only were admitted and on other nights, blacks only were admitted and never the twain shall meet. So we decided to test this and we got an integrated group together from the college and we, we attempted to 
I, I'm trying to remember, we, I think we attempted to go on a white night. And so we had groups, we had, you know, like, like two or three white kids and then a group of mixed, you know, white and black, and then maybe a group of, a, of several black kids. And uh, they, the roller skating rink acted very predictably. They let the white kids in, they turned the black kids away and we sued and uh, it went to trial and we won. And so we desegregated the roller skating rink in wherever it was um, outside of Swarthmore. And, uh, and then we, we also participated in uh, civil rights activities in sit-ins and whatnot. Of course, there weren't any locally, but by that time there were um, the, the sit-in movement and the civil rights movement in general had moved north, so to speak. So there was a lot of activity going on in Maryland and that wasn't all that far away. So we would sometimes go down on weekends and participate in, in picketing. And um, at least once in there, I was arrested um, for, I, I don't even remember for what, but I spent the weekend in jail in, in Maryland. And when I got back to Swarthmore, the Dean of Women called me in and, um, she didn't scold me. I mean, this after all was a Quaker school and she would have been a hypocrite if she said, you shouldn't be doing these things. But she just wanted to admonish me that um, I was a campus leader and a role model. And I was also a very, very good student. I was getting very good grades and that I should understand that as a role model, I was influencing other undergraduates who might not be quite as strong academically and might suffer from losing a weekend by being arrested and spending it in jail in Maryland. And I should take that into account when I did my stuff with SPAC. So I thanked her very much for her concern and I went right on doing whatever it was I was doing. I mean, I mean, I, I may have had a word or two with kids before they went, you know, before they signed up for something, say, you know, you understand the risk, you might get arrested. And, you know, if you have a big exam on Monday or you have a paper due on Monday, I'd suggest you not sign up for this one, you know, wait for a couple of weeks and there'll be another one, whatever. Um, During this time, how did you feel about Kennedy's commitment to the civil rights movement? Um, I, well, I suppose summarized in a word, good. And I don't know that Kennedy himself said all that much, but it was his justice department, it was his brother. And um, somehow, we had the sense that they were our friends. And that became much, much, a much, much stronger feeling when I went to Louisiana. So I don't know, at Swarthmore, um, I mean, I think that we liked Kennedy just because he was he was this breath of fresh air and he was liberal and all those things. This was Camelot and all that business. But I don't know that we had any strong feelings about him one way or the other. And I, I think our feelings about the Kennedy administration became much stronger when I was in Louisiana because it was then that um, basically reduced to its, its essence, we knew that the Justice Department was our friend and the FBI was our enemy. And so when, and we knew also that in any major thing in Louisiana, like in a situation where the very first black person to attempt to register in West Feliciana Parish was going up to the courthouse, that there would be Justice Department observers or that, that we would be able to reach the Justice Department. And in fact, we all had, um, and in fact, I still have the little telephone directory, um, you know, where you'd write down people's phone numbers, I still have John Doerr's personal number 
written down there because we were, you know, we were told if you're ever in a situation where you need help, call John Doerr immediately. Um, I mean, and, and we knew that, that for all intents and purposes, the FBI was staffed by a bunch of Ku Klux Klaners and they were about as much help as the Klan would be. Uh, and they were, I mean, that's, that was their traditional reputation. Um, they, they would be no more help in, in, in defending a black person trying to register to vote than, as I say, a local member of the Klan. So uh, we knew that the justice, and, and um, for example, in, in that instance in, in West Feliciana Parish, when that Reverend Joseph Carter, who was the first black person to attempt to register to vote and to get registered eventually, um, he disappeared after his first attempt to register, he disappeared. And I do believe the Justice Department moved right in. Uh, he was found. I, I, I don't remember all the details, but he was, he was found. But, but the Justice Department was absolutely poised. And, and I also, I can remember another time I was arrested in the uh, sister parish of East Feliciana Parish, which is where I was pretty much headquartered. And at one point, as a result of we, um, well, it's a whole long story, but we, we helped to organize a sit-in at the local public library, which was quite, quite segregated to the point where Blacks were not allowed in the public library building. They could only use the blue bookmobile um, as opposed to the red bookmobile, which went to the white areas. But in any event, as part of that whole that that whole project, I wasn't even technically a part of it. Like I wasn't up at the library, but I was arrested as whatever they call it, you know, material witness or whatever they call it. And I was I was popped into the Clinton City Jail. And within a day, there was a young Justice Department attorney in there to, to interview me, to find out if I had been harassed, to find out what the details were, what the whole situation was, et cetera, et cetera. And the poor guy, he had obviously just flown in from Washington, DC, you know, you know, not long out of law school. There he was in his starched white shirt and his tie and his jacket. And he's taken up to my cell and I'm in a cell all by myself. I'm in the white women's cell and there were no other white women in Clinton who were in jail at the moment. So I was in there all by myself. And this attorney is put in the cell with me and the jailer of course slams the door shut. And this poor guy, I could just see his face going white. Um, I mean, he... <laughs> He probably wondered to himself if he was ever going to get out of this jail cell. Of course he did. I mean, it would, I, and I never worried about him. But anyway, uh, the, the, so the Justice Department was our friend. So, and the Justice Department was Robert Kennedy, who was John F. Kennedy's brother. So, by still attending Swarthmore at the time of the assassination? No, no. By that time, I had graduated. So, I graduated. Um, in June of 63. And by that time, well, okay, here was the federal government, here was the Kennedy administration at work. After the Freedom Rides and the sit-ins, Kennedy was sort of between a rock and a hard place. I mean, looking back now, I didn't realize it at the time, but looking back now, I can see the dilemma that he was in. On the one hand, he has this racial unrest, which at the time was the most violent thing anybody had seen on TV. I mean, people are seeing people beaten up and blood pouring down their faces just because they rode a bus and, and you know, being beaten to the ground. And um, um, this, is, th this is absolutely horrible. And these images, of course, are being beamed all over the world to, uh, and of course, the Soviet Union. And Khrushchev is playing this for all it's worth. Look what capitalism is like. Look what kind of racial injustice, what capitalism means for 
um, for racial injustice. It, 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 th th that's what it's all about. And 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 look what you know this this great country that that considers itself the you know the 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 capitalist example for the world, and this is the best they can do. And look at the Soviet Union, we're living here all in peace and harmony, we don't have any of these situations, and blah, blah. And Kennedy is beside himself. And he's about to have a, a <clears throat> one of his number of summits with Khrushchev. And he's, so they're, they're trying to figure out on a federal level, what the heck to do about this. And as I understand it from my reading, and again, I haven't delved into it and, you know, into the primary sources, but my understanding is that between the federal government and there was a private, um, um, a, a private nonprofit organization, they're faced with a dilemma. On the one hand, we do not want to suppress the civil rights workers. We don't want to stop them from doing, from protesting against stuff that is clearly wrong. On the other hand, we want to get them out of the radar, get them under the radar, get them where it's not going to be international news and Khrushchev is not going to be crowing about it. And so they come up with the idea of voter registration. And this is, this is the perfect solution. I mean, it is, and it is the perfect solution all the way around. Because on the one hand, you're not gonna have people demonstrating openly and <clears throat> openly walking into lunch counters or bus stations or buses or trains and, and overtly protesting the system, but you're going to have, you know, all over the South on very, very local level, um, people, trying to convince local residents to, to try to register to vote. And this is going to be just much, much more low key. It's gonna be off the radar. Um, there, there aren't gonna be any violent demonstrations and this is the perfect solution. Now from the civil rights movement's point of view, this also was a perfect solution because you talk about power to the people. This is the ultimate expression of power to the people. And this is something that we even saw at the time that if we continue um, hacking away at segregation one little target at a time, like, okay, first we go after lunch counters, then we go after, okay, well, no, maybe first we went after public schools, then we go after lunch counters, then we go after interstate public transportation. At this rate, it's going to be the 22nd century before, you know, we get rid of most of segregation. There has to be a better way. And there also has to be a better way of power to the people, of having the people themselves expressing what they want and getting what they want from their own voices. And how do people ultimately express their, their voices but through the ballot box? And so everybody came on board, the federal government and the civil rights movement. And thus was born the Committee of Federated Organizations, COFO, uh, which brought together the major civil rights organizations. And they basically um, divided up the South and each organization got one part of the South and that's where they would concentrate on voter registration. So CORE, so to speak, got, the, uh, got Louisiana. They, they, they were doing little bits in Mississippi, I think, and I don't know where, maybe other places, but it was primarily, primarily, primarily Louisiana. And I, of course, heard about this. I mean, I had kept in touch with, with CORE. I had done public speaking for them after the Freedom Rides. I'd helped them raise money. My parents had done the same. Um, and so um, I signed up to be part of their voter registration project in, in Louisiana. And so I basically went almost literally straight from graduation in college to Louisiana, although the project hadn't started quite yet. So I made a detour to the Eastern shore of Maryland and I worked with them for a couple of weeks 
until the project was ready to get started in Louisiana. And then um, I made my way to Louisiana and, and I ended up working in Louisiana for probably the equivalent of about two years. So I, I went there for just that summer and I had already been accepted to graduate school in American history at, at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And uh, I was very excited about going there. But that summer working in voter registration in Louisiana had such a profound impact on me, um, including one particular incident where I was sitting on the front porch with this elderly lady and this is, you know, your typical Southern was sitting on the front porch, rocking and rocking chairs, I'm sipping lemonade or something. And, and I am trying to convince her about why voter registration is so important. And she proceeds to say to me, basically, of course, I know why it's so important. My great, however many great grandfathers served in the Louisiana State Senate during Reconstruction and was lynched on his way home one time from the Senate. And I just, I was like blown away. I thought, oh my God, this is history happening. I mean, this is history. And so fast forwarding, I was supposed to go to graduate school to, to specialize in the period of Jacksonian democracy. And when I finally did go to graduate school, I switched to civil war and reconstruction. And I wrote my master's thesis on, on black political activity in reconstruction, Louisiana. And I managed to track down this woman's story. I mean, in other words, I, was ma I managed to corroborate it in, in a primary source in a newspaper article that reported on his lynching. Um, and, but in any event, so, I, I, um, uh, I, so after that summer, I decided no way could I pick up and leave. So I wrote to Wisconsin, asked if I could defer my entrance for a year. And they said, fine, no problem. I mean, I was amazed at how, you know, they didn't put up a fight at all. Um, and so I stayed that whole next year through the next summer and then I went to graduate school, but then I came back to Louisiana every summer for about three or four summers after that. Um, Can you speak to any concrete changes that you noticed as the civil rights bill became law in 64 oh and then gosh. voting rights in 65? Oh my gosh, yes. So the Civil Rights Act, not so much um, in part because it was, theory, I mean, you didn't see anything being desegregated, like lunch counters and, um, I mean, things, nothing, nothing really changed. If anything, things got worse. Um, and in fact, as I recall, what happened was, so, okay, during that year, um, and I guess this was even before the Civil Rights Act, but um, this would have been true after the Civil Rights Act also. Um, we were continuing to do voter registration and at some point, and, and the situation was escalating in a, in a very bad way. Like people would show up at the registrar's office in Clinton and there was a, a, a dead black cat hanging from the registrar's sign. Um, the, and, and the registrar would do everything he could to make to make it a totally unpleasant experience. And it was even worse in West Feliciana Parish. The people had to wait outside in the sweltering heat in the sun, at least in Clinton, they mostly were waiting inside the building, but it wasn't air conditioned. There was this, you know, the typical Southern ceiling fans, which just circulated a lot of hot air. And, but they would stand all day waiting for their turn. And the registrar would maybe do two people and then declare that it was time for lunch break. And then two hours later, he'd come back and do maybe two more people. And then he'd declare that the, the, the day was over and close the office and say, well, you'll have to come back tomorrow. And as I say, this went on for a while until finally the registrar announced 
that he was closing the registration office totally because he was getting conflicting advice. On the one hand, the federal government was telling him to do one thing, you know, the Civil Rights Act. And on the other hand, he was being told by the state, the highest courts in the state, not to do those things. And he didn't know what to do. So the only thing he could think to do was to close the office totally. So nobody could register. And at that point, we changed our direction and uh, got into um, what I guess would later be called community organizing. We tried to organize um, the sweet potato farmers. Anyway, we, we, we did, and, and that was when we also did, I think the library sit in um, and we did a number of things. I don't remember what caused the voter registration offices to open again, if they ever did. Um, but at some point I wasn't there during the year, but okay. When the Voting Rights Act passed in 1965, because I came back that summer of 65, and you talk the change, again, it was a, a seminal incident that just blew me away. Well, okay, so in West Feliciana Parish, there was this black Masonic lodge, which is where we held, we had held all our voter registration clinics where back in the day, we taught people how to fill out these unbelievably Byzantine uh, voter registration forms that went on for pages um, and totally Byzantine. And the main goal of which was to prevent blacks from voting. Cause you make one teeny weeny mistake. You don't dot an I across a T or you, you incorrectly answer some question like how many years, months and days are, are you, you know, your age in years, months and days. And if your calculation is one day off from the way the registrar calculated it, you know, you, you would fail. Um, okay, so of course the, the, um, the, the Voting Rights Act um, it wasn't that it did away with that, but uh, the, 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 the entire area that we were in, the 6th con Congressional District, basically de gets declared a voting disaster area. Uh, I mean, they, they're, they're going on the number of black votes that have been cast, I think, in the previous two presidential elections or something like that. And of course, in the 6th Congressional District, you practically count that on a couple of hands. Um, I exaggerate slightly, but only slightly. And so all these counties qualified for federal aid. And what that meant was that it totally bypassed this local Schmendrick um, registrar voters. And they sent in federal registrars who operated out of those little construction trailers. And, and, and there were no forms. I mean, you came up and you signed your name or you made an X and you were registered to vote. And you could you could vote in any election, and it as I say it totally bypassed the local registrar, and people turned out. Well, people were, I mean, it was it was like, um, what, what's the word? It, it it was like the Messiah had come. It, I mean, people just were in seventh heaven. So it as luck would have it. It turned out that that fall, there was going to be an election uh, in, in West Feliciana Parish and among the offices up for election was a local sheriff. Well, the same guy had been sheriff for you know decades. He is the one who of course had practically authorized the Ku Klux Klan to burn crosses on people's lawns, including ours. Um, to uh, you know, um, to, to to beat people who tried to register up with the with rifle butts, um, to shoot. Uh, we got shot at once as we left the courthouse in in St. Francisville. Um, this is the sheriff. This is the same sheriff who, um, and who, who I I think actually stood in the way of Reverend Carter as he tried to approach the registrar the very first time. Okay, he's running for re-election. 
Well, there are a whole bunch of other people running for sheriff. And I am trying to remember if any of them were black and I don't remember. But what I do remember is that um, there was going to be a, a candidate's night at this black Masonic temple. And the place was packed. And of course, I was probably one of the very, very few white people in the room. I mean, the, probably the only other white people in the room were the candidates. Everybody else in the room were, were all the, the local blacks who had all gotten themselves registered. And arrayed in front of them, across the front of the room, is this semicircle of candidates for sheriff, including the incumbent. And I sat there in the back of the room just with my mouth hanging open because I thought this guy who he could very well have been a Klan member was having to get up and appeal to this hall full of black people for their vote and they should vote for him. And I remember thinking, what the heck is this guy gonna say? I mean, what can he say? I mean, I, I, I don't want to draw any analogies, but it was an impossible situation. So he said about the only thing that he could say, which is that I have been your sheriff for all these years and I have kept this county safe. And, <laughs> and people were trying not to laugh. And um, as I say, I don't think at that point there were other black candidates for sheriff. Um, needless to say, at the election that fall, which I was not there for, I was back in school, um, he lost. Hmm. After all those years in office, I don't know who got elected, you know, some white guy who promised that everybody would be treated fairly or something. There were also elections for, what did they call them? Um... Louisiana had strange names for all its public institutions. You know, like the counties are all called par police jury. Um, so the county councils were called police juries. And um, so I think, I don't remember if it was that same trip or whether it was a subsequent trip where there were a bunch of black people all running for the police jury and getting elected. And then um, 10 years ago at the 50th anniversary, well, oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. It would have been a little less than 10 years ago. Um, there was an anniversary of um, some sort of anniversary of the, of the Louisiana Corps people. And I went and after the main several days of, of reunion, several of us got in a car and drove up to um, St. Francisville. And that was when um, it was like, you know, St. Francisville had entered the 20th century. Um, the first thing we did when we got into town, it was lunchtime and we were hungry. So there was a McDonald's. There had never been a McDonald's in St. Francisville when we were there. So we walk into the McDonald's, we were in an integrated group. Um, there was a, a, a black guy and a white guy and me. We walk in and we're, we don't know what to expect. The place, it was like walking into any, any McDonald's anywhere. I mean, there were black kids behind the counter serving there were blacks and whites sitting at tables. There was no like special area that the blacks had to sit in. Um, so we got our food and sat down at a table together. Nobody stared at us. Nobody came over to us and said, would you please leave? Um, it, and then we visited some of our old um, cohorts there and there, there were blacks serving at every level of county government. By that time, there had been, and there may have been at that time, a black sheriff. 
um, I mean, there the, the were blacks at, at, at every level and there was still a Confederate soldier on his big pedestal in front of the, the county courthouse. But um, it, you know, we just were all standing there with our mouths open um, at, at the changes that had taken place in, in St. Francisville. The, the areas that we, um, you know, a lot of the, the really, the really, 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 really run down black areas had been replaced with, you know, cinder block houses. I mean, it, you know, it, 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 I mean, it didn't look like a Dallas suburb, but it was certainly a huge improvement over what had, what had been there. Um, it was very funny because the, the black guy with us was, had been the, the, the core field secretary, Ronnie Moore, uh, when we were working there. And Ronnie was, was a trifle nervous. And, um, you know, we, so we visited with people that we wanted to visit with. And at some point, Ronnie said, we better hit the road and get out of here before the sun sets. So, you know, it, it wasn't perfect. And I, I'm sure that even if we had been driving after dark, I don't think anything would have happened to us, but, but the, 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 the change. And, and the, the other thing that impressed me was that to this day, the percent of people and particularly the black community in, in that area of Louisiana who, who are registered and vote is much higher than the rest of the country. I mean, you look at, you know, San Francisco, which is pathetic. You're lucky if you get 50% of the people out to the polls. But here were people who understood what voting meant and had fought for it, literally fought for it. Considering the relevance right now of voting rights, I, I'm wondering uh, if you have any words of wisdom or lessons from the 60s that you might be able to share directly with young activists today or future activists who might watch this recording who want to get involved. Yeah, I, I think that what you have to watch, because um, what you have to watch is what is actually happening on the ground. And I don't care what the regulations are, what the, what the voting protocol is in an area, how is it actually working? Who is actually voting? And if it's, if it's clear that there, are, um, that, that there are Blacks or Hispanics or whatever other group that are not turning out to vote, it's important to figure out why. And, is it because of these regulations or is it um, cynicism which needs to be overcome? And I think in, in many ways, the situation today is so much more complicated than it was then. Um, Cause then, you know, we were, we were working to get people a very, very basic right to vote. And, and, and you know, it was, it was interesting to me because once people got the right to vote, you began to see things happening in this area with, with you know, internecine politics and, and people not, um, you know, black people talking against uh, uh, one of the black candidates for some reason. And it was, it was like, welcome, you know, welcome to the 20th century or welcome to the 21st century. It was uh, welcome to modern reality. So I, I, I think, and once you find that something is wrong, it needs to be addressed and it needs to be addressed nonviolently. I mean, what really, really, really upsets me about what the kind of protests I'm seeing now is how quickly they descend into violence. And that serves nobody's purpose. One thing I didn't get a chance to ask you earlier, where were you on the day of the assassination? You know, I, was, I, I have been meaning to get back to that. I was in I was in Clinton, um, and in in Clinton, we stayed. And by we, at that point, it was maybe myself and a young black woman. And I'm trying to remember if any of the guys were there at that time. But there there was an elderly black lady in the community. Her name was Josephine Holmes, but everybody called her Mama Joe, and she had a shack 
like everybody else's shack, but it was two bedrooms and she lived alone. Her husband was long since deceased and her children were all grown. And she would rent out her other bedroom to local black workers, like people coming in to fix the roads or fix the rail ties or do construction. And if they were blacks, there was nowhere for them to stay. There was no local hotel, Motel 6 or something. So she would put them up. So um, she was approached very, very early in the game when CORE was first setting itself up. And she absolutely agreed. You know, CORE paid her um, and she housed us all. And she was a character. I mean, she took no guff from anybody. Um, and anyway, we, uh, her house was sort of like a headquarters. Like we held voter registration clinics there uh, where people would, as I say, they would come and we would teach them how to fill out these forms. And I remember the day that Kennedy was assassinated was a day that we were having voter registration clinic in her house. And so we were all in the living room, you know, two or three of us who were um, core workers and there were maybe one or two people at her table there in the room. And, um, uh, and you know, we were going over the forms with them and I, Mama Jo listened to the radio a lot and she was listening to the radio and the news came that Kennedy had been shot. Um, and then a short time after that, that he had died and Mama Jo burst into tears and she was just inconsolable and everybody else pretty much started crying also. But um, there was this very, very strong feeling that, that everybody had lost their hero and um, did you initially think since it happened in a segregated city like Dallas that civil rights was responsible? Uh, no, no. Um, no, I don't know what we thought. Um, I mean, the news was portraying it that it was this lone assassin. And to the extent that anything came out afterwards, he had ties to Castro in Cuba, but um, it was just, it was a very, very visceral reaction that everybody had. Do you remember anything else from that weekend as, as far as the funeral or Oswald being shot on Sunday, anything stand out? No, I mean, we, we knew about that. Oswald being shot, I don't think anybody got upset about that in the same way that Kennedy being shot got people upset. I mean, we basically just regrouped and went back to doing what we were doing. I mean, there was nothing else to do. And it was important to, uh, particularly important to keep the momentum going and not let a single event like that derail us. Uh, um, and we were enough, I mean, seriously, we're, we're living out in the, Seriously, this is the boondocks. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if we even had a television. If there was a, a lot of people in Clinton had televisions. Um, but Mama Joe certainly listened to the radio. But I mean, we may have followed the news, but we were much, much more concerned with what we were doing locally. And that, that took up all of our time. So we weren't following the news. Um, we, I think I, I don't know that how the local people reacted. Initially was a little bit leery that now Lyndon Johnson was president and he was a southerner. And what did this portend? And of course that turned out to be the absolute opposite of what we feared. Um, he manages to push through all this legislation that that Kennedy started. And, um, you know, I tend to think the Voting Rights Act in particular, because I remember I used to teach this when I taught U.S. government, um, he knew how things worked in the Senate. And he knew, he had that, that mannerism of, of getting in your face, of kind of defying personal space. 
and he would sort of intimidate uh, legislators. And I think he was played a large role in getting that Voting Rights Act through. But I do know that that the minute that act went into effect, I mean, I suppose it took several days for the Justice Department to get its um, its little caravans down into this, these southern communities. But people were lined up, you know, knee deep to get registered. It was the highlight of their lives. You, you have shared a remarkable narrative today. You have made my job so easy uh, because oh. you just shared such a compelling story with so much rich detail. And I cannot oh. thank you enough for the fascinating way in which you took me through your experiences. Oh, well, you, you're very, very welcome. You're very welcome. Um, you know, it's, I, I feel a teensy weensy sense of mission about the whole thing because one of the things that sort of horrifies me, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the freedom rights and the civil rights movement, the voting rights stuff that we did was like yesterday. But as far as the younger generation today and even not so young, people have never even heard of this. Um, I remember being asked to, um, give a presentation about the Freedom Rides at a, uh, a K through six school or something, a private school in San Francisco. Anyway, this was to like the fourth grade, I think. And I was a little reluctant at first thinking, good Lord, you know, fourth graders, what are they gonna understand? Well, that was fine. And as a matter of fact, they reacted beautifully but what was interesting to me was that they put on, they created an entire presentation where they had been broken up into teams and each team had to create a poster board presentation about some aspect of the Freedom Rides. And then they had this big parents day and the parents all came in and you know they went to the, the grade room of, of their kid and they were shown whatever project the, the class had put on. And I was invited to be there as kind of exhibit A or something. And I was amazed at the number of parents who came up to me to tell me, A, how excited their child was. They came home from school that day, so excited at dinner, saying they had met a freedom rider who had been in jail. And the parents were embarrassed to admit that they had no idea what the freedom rights were. Mm. Now, these are highly educated, wealthy people in San Francisco. This was no, you know, for stuck in a little junky private school. This is, a, you know, one of the really good private schools in San Francisco uh, in a very, very tony part of town. And, you know, anyway, so, I kind of feel like as long as I have breath to breathe and a voice to speak, uh, I wanna do as much as I can to educate people, not just because this was an interesting historical event, but as I said briefly in answer to your question, what, what this means for today and the lessons that we can learn from today and that we can learn an enormous amount from what John Lewis preached 